Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us, and I hope the presentation will be interesting. So I am Steven Metai, and I will present today uh, the anomaly detection system that we developed in the CERN cloud uh, infrastructure. Let me start with, with uh, presenting our team. So we are a bunch of data scientists and data engineers in the CERN cloud team. And uh, we have Domenico Giordano, uh, a CERN senior staff, which was uh, supervising the whole project. And then me and uh, Antonin, we were uh, working on that for uh, one year and some months. And it was the topic of our master thesis. So here you have the QR code. You find all the uh, LinkedIn uh, links, the GitLab repository link, which is publicly available. And uh, I will also upload these slides uh, so you can uh, see them also later. And you have that also there. So I guess and I hope you can zoom it. So we can start now with the outline. So I will introduce the CERN context. I will uh, uh, give you the motivations of our work. Then we will see uh, some details about the system that uh, we built, about the pipeline and the orchestration. Then we will uh, talk about the machine learning models that the system uh, run. And then we will talk about the results. Uh, because we compared the old system that was in use at CERN with uh, our new data-driven one. Uh, and we will see the comparison in terms of, of true positive rates. So let's start with the introduction. For who doesn't know, CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Uh, it's located in the Swiss-French border, close to Geneva. And uh, uh, it was founded after the Second World War, uh, following the slogan of science for, uh, for peace. And uh, there, was, there were 12 member states originally. And then year after year, the number increased until reaching 23 plus many associated states and observer states. Uh, about the personnel, there are more than 3,000 staff and fellows working uh, in CERN, and around 13,000 associates, so many people and many employees. What is the objective of CERN uh, is to use uh, particle accelerators to make particle go um, close to the speed uh, of light. And uh, to do that, we use a large Hadron Collider, uh, which is 27 kilometers long, uh, underground. And we make those particles uh, crash to each other. Uh, we have also four different detectors. And uh, these detectors get all the data about the crashes. And all the data are then stored in the uh, big data center that we have in order to let the physicists then do the experiments to prove probably they, their theories. So of course, to do that, we need a, a huge uh, cloud infrastructure. And uh, in the CERN cloud infrastructure, we have many OpenStack components. And uh, the data center includes 9,000 uh, bare metal servers managed by OpenStack. Uh, and uh, bet between these 9,000, 2,000 of them are uh, configured as hypervisors. And, and they serve uh, around 13K virtual machines. And these virtual machines then offer many web services and uh, web applications to, do, to all the CERN employees and users. So of course, given the uh, dimension of the data center, we have also to have a big monitoring effort. We have to monitor all the OpenStack components and all the hypervisor and virtual machines that uh, run in the system, in the cloud. And of these hypervisors, we get the logs and the metrics, and we store them in uh, different, uh, using different frameworks like Elasticsearch, InfluxDB, and HDFS. And then we have also several Grafana dashboards. So we use them to have an overview of the current status of the cloud, to perform some post-mortem analysis, some data inspection, and in what we are interested more in this, uh, in this presentation, the alarming system. We are, interested in, we are interested in it because the alarming system, uh, it's basically a Grafana dashboard. And it's what we were using at CERN for uh, detecting anomalies in the, in the cloud. So this is based on, a, on, a, on an analysis of individual metrics. Here we can see, for example, 
that we have um, the disk I.O. time, and there was a static threshold at 900 milliseconds. So every hypervisor having uh, values uh, above this were considered uh, as, as anomalous. So this is uh, a bit inefficient because we have to set manually all the thresholds. And because of the huge number of servers, it's always difficult to manually go and find all these errors. And moreover, we are also missing here maybe something which, what is, which is anomalous. Uh, so that's why we wanted to propose a new data-driven approach. Uh, in, in this approach, we wanted to consider multiple time series in the same moment to maybe capture some correlation. And we wanted also to exploit uh, the fact that if we have groups of servers with similar configuration, uh, similar server, uh, normal servers will have similar behavior. And we will see at the end that indeed we uh, outperform the, the previous system. And more importantly, what we wanted from the, from the system is to proactively identify uh, operational issues before the users. What do we mean is that for sure this happened to you, so uh, probably you receive many tickets from the users saying uh, this metric is too low, or anyway, I have problems with uh, a certain uh, machine. And then you go to look at the data and you see that something is wrong, and you think, okay, I, I could have uh, so that before, right? So this is the point. We wanted with the system to avoid this situation uh, and to catch th those anomalies before the users. To do this, there are two main uh, possibilities. The first one is about uh, performing change detection. Uh, and it means that uh, if I have a time series uh, or a metric and I consider this as normal behavior, I want to detect a change uh, on the time series itself, considering then this as anomalous. Uh, or we can uh, group the servers uh, having the same configuration, as I was saying, same hardware and same software configuration, and same assignments. And we want, in this case, to catch different behavior uh, of, the, of a specific server, server with respect to other servers. So this is the, the approach that we follow. And to explain this, uh, we have here uh, a plot of the standardized uh, CPU load with respect to the data of uh, February of this year. And we are plotting here in blue a specific server uh, starting to have uh, an anomalous behavior. So we wanted to highlight here the fact that uh, having in red the maximum value of uh, the, the load we can see that this server is uh, reaching the maximum only in, in certain points. It means that for all the other periods, many other services, servers are reaching uh, anomalous values. And here we have the minimum and the three major percentiles to show you the normal behavior. So of course, when this server starts to go above uh, the, the normal values, we consider it as anomalous. So with our system, we want to catch those uh, examples. And let's have a look uh, to, uh, to the system. Uh, first of all, we had to build a library. Uh, this library is mainly written in Python, and uh, it is composed by two main parts. The first one is the ETL, uh, which stands for uh, Extract, Transform, and Load. So what we do is to uh, compute some normalization coefficients and then we transform the raw data in a windowed uh, normalized version. And then we save everything in pandas data frames that will be the inputs of, of our system. Then the second part is the anomaly detection uh, core, let's say. Uh, we call it uh, a discern, and uh, is an analyzer wrapper of PyOD, uh, which is the Python outlier detection library. Uh, we did a wrapper in, in order to have an extensible module, so we can add uh, um, many other uh, models in irritating from the PyOD library. And here we also have the code that we publish into the CERN monitoring infrastructure all the results, and we will see that later. Uh, all this module is uh, installable by pip, and uh, we do that in our Jupyter notebooks in the GitLab CI CD system. 
and the inhale flow, uh, which is the orchestrator that we use. So let's have a look on to our pipeline. Uh, this is the main pipeline, and uh, we can uh, divide it in uh, two parts. The first one in blue is the data analytics pipeline, which goes from the data sources to the publishing of uh, the anomalies that the models find. And then in orange, we have the annotation pipeline. Uh, and given the feedback from the experts of the cloud, uh, and uh, given a benchmark data set that uh, we, have to, we had to build, we kind of try to evaluate uh, our system in order to make some uh, changes and improving the, the results. We use many technologies in this pipeline. Uh, we always want to exploit uh, all the set of tools that CERN uh, uh, gives us. Uh, for example, HDFS, uh, Spark, Elasticsearch. So all the frameworks that are already in use, we try to, to use them. And the pipeline covers uh, all, the, uh, all the flow from the data sources using CollectD to the monitoring infrastructure, which is composed by Grafana and Kibana. And every step of the pipeline is containerized, uh, mainly using Docker. And if we try to apply these technologies to the pipeline, uh, we have this image. So as I was saying, in the data sources, uh, we use CollectD and HDFS. Then we load them uh, in the data preparation task, uh, and we use Spark to preprocess the data. At the end of this, we will have a Pandas data frame, uh, which will be the input of our machine learning core, which is built in uh, Python and TensorFlow. Then we make some ensemble strategies, and with FluentD, we publish the uh, anomaly results to Elasticsearch. And thanks to Grafana, we get the data from Elasticsearch. We build some dashboards in order to look at the results and to also evaluate the, the whole model. So as I was saying, uh, all the steps uh, are, uh, are based on Docker containers. And all this uh, process in the middle is orchestrated and scheduled from, uh, by Apache Hireflow. So uh, we want to have a look on this um, orchestrator. So Apache Hireflow is an open source uh, framework. Uh, we run it in a, another Docker composer itself, in a, another Docker container itself. And uh, on the left, we can see all the pipeline that I will explain in the next slide. But here we can see all the uh, runs that uh, Airflow scheduled. So it's very easy to find if something went wrong. Uh, every task is green if it was success successful, pink if it's skipped, and then we will see why we skip some uh, steps, and red, red if uh, it, uh, it was failing. So the ETL processes are submitted to the CERN infrastructure so we don't have to do them. But the Airflow deployment and all the machine learning uh, training and inference uh, are always run in a single VM. Um, of course, you want also to have uh, replications, so you can use multiple VMs. But what we want to highlight here is that uh, you can use just a single VM to deploy everything. This is the pipeline, more into more in deep, I hope you can read. But anyway, um, this is the pipeline. And uh, to write pipelines in Airflow, uh, there is uh, some Python code to be uh, written. And in this Python code, uh, you can uh, create tasks, and you can also create the order uh, of them. Here we have the training step and the inference step. And in every step, we check if we have already the data locally saved. If not, we start all the ETL process with uh, Spark. But if we have them, we just skip to the next uh, big, uh, big task. Uh, and also in the training uh, model uh, task, if the, train, the, if the models are already trained, we don't have to do anything, and we just skip to the inference step. The inference step then is the same, um, I have the same as the same structure of uh, the training one. But of course, this will run every time, because all the times that we have to make uh, some inference, the data will be new. And on the opposite, the training part will run just the first time. We want to highlight this uh, looking at these uh, two uh, graphs. So here we have the first execution of the pipeline. 
and here are the following ones. And we can see that in the first time that we run the pipeline, we have actually to uh, process all the training data. We have to process uh, uh, the machine learning models themselves and to save them. And then we can do all the inference steps. On the opposite, for the following executions, all the training part uh, is uh, very fast because we just check if we have the data and the models uh, already there. And then we spend all the time in the inference part. And this means that here we uh, use more or less 35 minutes. And here the duration is just seven, eight minutes. This is the input of our uh, uh, pipeline. So the system can run in uh, parallel with multiple algorithms. And uh, the input are uh, a bunch of uh, YAML files. So here, for example, we have the YAML file uh, saying which algorithms uh, the system must run and must uh, train. And uh, for every algorithm, we have also, of course, the parameters that we can uh, set. And as I was saying, uh, having a wrapper class of this uh, Py Python outlier detection library, we can extend our library with the new algorithms. On the opposite, this is the output of the system. And uh, as I was saying, uh, we use FluentD to push this uh, all uh, JSON uh, uh, file to Elasticsearch. In particular, we publish the top 20 uh, anomalous scores that we find for every four hours interval. And if we see the structure of the JSON, we are uh, indicating the details about the algorithm that we use, about the uh, hypervisor and uh, the group that we are uh, analyzing. We have here the metrics that are in input uh, to the model, and finally the, uh, detail, the details about the anomalies score. So now we can uh, see a bit of uh, the machine learning models that are inside the system. Uh, the first step uh, was to uh, check several anomaly detection models uh, in order to see which one was uh, the best one. Uh, and in particular, we focused on some traditional anomaly detection methods that here you can see in green, some deep learning ones, which are in uh, orange, and then we tried also some ensemble strategies in blue. Here you can see the AUC rock. I will talk about that later, but it's just a metric to measure the performances of the models. And we can see that uh, between the traditional and the deep learning uh, models, uh, the I forest, isolation forest, is the best one from the traditional ones. And the LSTM autoencoder is the best one from the deep learning family. So what we did is to uh, check only these two models and trying to uh, trying to improve them in order to improve the old system results. Let me talk also about uh, this model uh, uh, in more into de de the details. Um, the isolation forest is a traditional machine learning model uh, which is based on point isolation. So it means that if we consider the XI as uh, normal, uh, because inside a dense based region, we need many divisions of the hyperspace to then isolate the single point. On the opposite, if we consider only XO, uh, which is an outlayer because it's outside this, uh, let's say, cluster of data points, we need less divisions of the hyperspace to isolate it. So this is the main idea of the isolation forest. Talking about the deep learning uh, models that we use, we are using autoencoders. Uh, these are neural networks uh, which use uh, uh, some bottleneck to reduce the latent space of the input. And then they are trained to reconstruct the input itself. Um, moreover, if we use the LSTM and the GRU units, we are able to reconstruct multivariate time series. What does it mean? It means that if in input we have this time series, uh, for instance, is, uh, is still the normalized CPU load. If we train the autoencoder and then we run an inference step, uh, this will be the reconstructed input, uh, and it will be close to the uh, original input because the model is trained. And the main idea here for the anomaly detection purpose is that if we train the model with normal data, uh, then the model in the inference step will have a higher reconstruction error for anomalous windows, uh, with respect, of course, to the normal ones. 
So uh, all these models give in, in output some anomalous scores, and those scores are uh, higher with uh, higher probability of being anomalous. Uh, for instance, if we have these windows, <coughs> all the scores will be close to zero because everything is normal. And on the opposite, in the next one, these hypervisors uh, should have a higher value of the anomalous score. Uh, finally, before uh, looking the results, uh, these are the metrics that uh, we use in input. Uh, we selected them from uh, some experience, uh, looking the results and looking at the evaluation of our benchmark data set. And also, uh, they, they were uh, given from the cloud managers at CERN. So namely, we use uh, the context switches, the CPU load, the CPU system, the disk I.O. time, the pending operations, and the memory free. Uh, of course, you can add more inputs, but talking about unsupervised learning, uh, it's better to keep the set of inputs uh, as, uh, as small as possible in order to not, not have many correlated inputs. So let's see the results. Uh, talking about the figures of merit, because of course we have to decide how to measure uh, the results uh, and how to measure the performance of the models. We usually use the uh, rock curve to in the anomaly detection field, which is a, a plot which plots the false positive rate against the true positive rate. And usually to measure the performance of the models, we use the area under the curve which gives us a single number giving us the performance of the model. What we did for, perform for comparing the old system and the uh, new one is to set a specific false positive rate uh, given by the cloud managers, and usually is uh, quite small because in production you don't want many uh, false, uh, false positive. And then setting that to a specific value we will look at the different true positive rate of the different strategies to, to decide which is the best one. Uh, to do this, we also need a benchmark data set. Uh, there is a lack of uh, publicly available data sets about this topic. Uh, so what we did is to uh, build our uh, own data set. Uh, we looked at 40 hosts, 40 servers, uh, with respect to two months of data. And then we labeled a total of 12,000 windows of four hours, having the 2% of them as anomalous. So these are the results. Uh, as I was saying, we set the false positive, fal false positive rate uh, to 0.1%, which is low but is acceptable from the cloud uh, uh, managers. And uh, we were looking here to the true positive rates of the two strategies. So we had 8% uh, for the current system based on the thresholds, and 21% uh, on the system uh, uh, which, which was data-driven. We also tried to increase this value, just to see, for example, at 4% of false positive rate what was happening. And we had that the current system uh, wasn't able to catch anyway many, uh, many anomalies. It was 26% of true positive rate against our 92%. Uh, so we can say that uh, our machine learning model uh, and machine learning system was able to outperform uh, the previous one. So summarizing, uh, we engineered and designed this anomaly detection system, uh, which is also modular and extendable and uh, can be used from uh, others uh, in both the CERN context and also in other contexts. The system used three major machine learning models, the isolation forest, the LSTM GRU autoencoders, and it leverages the collective behavior of similar servers. So this is the main point, and we think that this is why it works uh, pretty well. And that's why uh, it also outperforms the threshold-based solution of uh, Grafana that was used from the cloud CERN servers, from the cloud CERN uh, managers. So this was it. Thank you for the attention. And of course, we have five minutes more or less for questions. And uh, thank you for the attention. <laughs> and if you have questions, please go to the microphones, because uh, it's recorded. Or I can repeat them. Um, Thank you for the presentation, it was really interesting. 
I have one question. Um, all the metrics made sense to me, but I was wondering why you chose memory free over memory used. That seems a bit counterintuitive. Is there any specific reason? Was memory free more specific, or is it just because it's easier yeah, in some way? There is no specific uh, answer, uh, a specific reason. As I was saying, uh, we were just trying to not have uh, correlated inputs. So one of the two was anyway good. Okay. So, but it was a bit random, actually. Okay, thank we you. We just used the uh, memory free, and the cloud managers said that was okay. All right. Okay, thank you so much.